All right, so today we're going to be talking about Deleuze and Guattari's idea of intensive difference. And this is a particularly exciting part of their philosophy that is going to counteract some of Hegel's troubles and allow us to understand ontology not as this set idea of substances and enduring objects, but rather a sliding continuum of intensive differences, of intensities and multiplicity, that is constantly in reciprocal presupposition with other things. So if we really want to get a grasp on this, we have to see that in a sense, they are counteracting some problems with Hegel, which is that Hegel's system thought of difference as indeed being a necessity. In order for things to be, there naturally has to be something other than that thing. This is why Hegelianism is great for proving that solipsism is wrong. Solipsism, of course, being the idea that the only thing that exists is my self-consciousness. Everything else is an illusion, and it's just me here. Everything else, I mean, it's like, it's like taking Descartes' kind of dream analogy to the extreme. Hegel notes that, okay, for the self exist, to exist, the other has to exist too. And the other has to exist as an independent entity, in order that that other may recognize my being, my existence. And this is the dialectic of recognition that is set up in the master-slave dialectic in the phenomenology of spirit. Now we're good here so far. Hegel's, this is the height of the acceptance of difference in Hegel's philosophy. That difference is a necessity. And that if we really want to have an ontological system, we must have genuine difference that cannot conflate these different entities with each other, that cannot reduce them to each other. But then Hegel goes down the rails and he says, well, actually, that difference is going to be sublated dialectically. It is going to get taken up and it is going to be both done away with and retained and it is purposely contradictory. Hegel tries to throw out the law of non-contradiction, which throws in a whole list of problems. But Hegel ultimately thinks that difference is only apparent. That in the end, everything is everything that is is being. And specifically, it is Geist. And it is Geist coming to self-realize itself. And realize is an important thing because it's an active process for Hegel. Hegel thinks that this process of everything being realized as Geist and becoming the one is an active process that comes by sublating differences into the one. Now, Deleuze and Guattari think that this is an issue. And this is a problem with Hegelianism in general, is that this monism of Geist is essentially, I mean, it's a very fascistic way of doing ontology because it's like, no, difference is only apparent. And really, we have this teleological way in which reason drives everything forward to be sublated into the one. So Hegel's like, look, eventually we're going to get our perfect utopian fascistic state where everything is the one and everything is this big, it's, it's almost like Arianism, but with Geist, like everything is going to be Geist and it's going to be wonderful. And reason is naturally going to do this as contradictions get sublated. So don't worry about it. The problem with this is it doesn't actually understand difference at all. Hegel only understands difference as sameness. He only understands difference as it can be sublated into the one. For example, Hegel thinks that, like we said before, that these binaries between like self and other are naturally going to come about. 
between Geist, which is the self, spirit, and the other, which is not Geist. So we have this Geist and not Geist binary that is naturally going to form, and it has to form. But then Hegel's like, no, it's all going to get sublated as Geist. So ultimately, what is not Geist is reduced to Geist and sublated and turned into Geist. And the same thing happens with being and not being. Hegel says that, well, being must exist, being must be, but in order for being to make sense, there must be non-being with which we can juxtapose it with. And then Hegel says, well, non-being must also exist, therefore both being and non-being can be sublated as both existing and become sublated as Geist. But the problem is, Hegel's not actually understanding non-being here or non-existence. He's understanding non-existence as existence, as a way in which we can think of it and conceptualize it as a form of existence. And, I mean, <laughs> Parmenides says this, like hundreds and hundreds of years before Hegel. You can't actually think about nothing. You can't actually conceptualize of nothing because in order to conceptualize, you have to be forming some kind of concept with some content. And nothing, by definition, has no content whatsoever. So Deleuze and Guattari are like, okay, we need difference for ontology. And we do not want to come into some sort of monism where we have a substance monism, where everything is reduced to one substance, whether it be Geist or water or air, like some of the pre-Socratics, none of this stuff. And I think the best way to think about their idea of intensive difference is to look at day versus night. This is a typical binary, that we have the daytime and we have the nighttime. And the basic Hegelian move here is, well, in order for day to exist and make sense, there must be not day. There must be night. And by these two having independent existence, both benefit. Both recognize each other and both have independent existence, and this is great. Now, Hegel will try to subsume this, but for Deleuze and Guattari, they say that similar to Hegel, both of these are in reciprocal presupposition. Day cannot exist without night, and night cannot exist without day. But not only this, but there is no absolute day or absolute night. These are not independent entities, and this is how they differ from Hegel. Is Hegel says, okay, the self is this independent entity, and the other is this independent entity, and they have existence because they cannot be reduced to one another. Now, Deleuze and Guattari do think that multiplicity, that there is genuine difference, but it's always relative difference, which is to say that the entities that come out of this difference, such as day and night, only exist in reciprocal presupposition with each other and also on a sliding continuum between each other such that what it means to be night is defined relative to day. It is a differential relation. They talk a lot about calculus and like dx, the differential in Antiedipus, to point out that day does not just exist absolutely. It exists as an intensity of light, an intensity of heat, an intensity of geothermal activity, an intensity of, you know, uh, of life cycles of plants and animals around it. It exists as this whole assemblage of things which are in reciprocal presupposition with each other, which defines what day is. And there is no absolute day, but only an intensity of day. How, how day is it? Is it midday? Is it morning? Is it evening? And all of these are intensities of the kind of day with a capital D. But there is no day with capital D. 
there are only intensities of different flows, flows of air pressure, flows of heat from the sun, flows of chemicals interacting in the environment. All of this different stuff comes together and coalesces on the plane of consistency or the body without organs to come to give us an understanding of what day or night is. And the important thing to note is Dulce and Guattari are going to take this idea not necessarily of self-sublation, but more of self-deterritorialization, which is to say that day has a sort of territory. This is the idea of day with a capital D. It has this, this kind of place where it feels at home. But of course, this home is nowhere else than as a collection of intensive differences engaged in a process of changing. I really like this way, which they only just now started talking about where I'm at in A Thousand Plateaus, and I had been using this example before I even read it. I felt so good when I read it and was like, I've, I've been using that example the whole time. But it is better to think of partial objects as vectors. Partial objects can be animals. It can be day or night. Any of these things that are the result of intensive differences or flows that are coalescing together to function in a relative manner to other intensities and flows and bodies without organs. These partial objects are all defined as vectors. And this is from physics. In physics, a vector is defined by a magnitude and a direction. So it's an arrow and it has various sizes, various you know, scales of how big or small it is. That is to say that any of these partial objects, such as night at a particular time at night, is always defined as a vector, as a magnitude, or an intensity, and an intensity that results from other intensities, and a direction. It has a place towards which it is driving. Dules and Guattari are incredibly displeased with the idea of things being static or things being sedentary. They think this is not how partial objects work because partial objects are the result of differences. And these intensive differences are always going to drive motion forward. And this is the rate or speed of deterritorialization. How fast or slow or with what intensity is day turning into nighttime or night turning into day? This speed is essentially the direction and magnitude of the vector. It is defined by a place or a function towards which it has yet to arrive and to which it will never arrive. That's the important part, is that these intensive differences are never going to settle in one place for too long. They may find stable states, but these stable states, these senses of equilibrium will not hold for very long. For example, there's this idea of homeostasis in biology, that an organism has a number of different functions, which we say make it alive. And the, the definition of life, th there is no definition of life in biology. There are tons of contentions about what makes something alive. But we have all these ideas of it produces energy, it can self-locomote, it can reproduce on its own without a host. And these things allow it to reach a form of equilibrium. And this equilibrium or this homeostasis allows it to have an enduring existence as an organism without which it would simply immediately denature and become enveloped. And you can see this with a very small microorganism which has a cell membrane which has been punctured or in a solution in which the pH is outside of their range of tolerance, the cell membrane will 
just crumple away. It will deterritorialize. And thus, each organism has a sense of homeostasis, of a stable state that it reaches, as a result of a collection of intensities, the intensity of pressure in its environment, the intensity of nutrients traveling into and out of it, the intensity of heat and convection currents. All these different things are going to go, come together to allow the organ to have, or the organism, I should say, to have a stable existence. But these partial objects, these amoebas, these microorganisms, these humans, these animals, everything exists on the body without organs. And the body without organs resists organization. That is to say, it resists becoming an organism. And we can see this with life. Life is always fighting against its deterritorialization. It's always fighting against its death. It's always absorbing more nutrients and um, expanding outward and occupying more territory in an effort to survive. But it can't do this forever because eventually it reaches a point where it must simply decompose. It must simply reach this moment of deterritorialization after which a threshold has been passed and the organism ceases to be. And with our example of the microorganism earlier, with its cell wall, which is in a solution, or its cell membrane, I should say, and it's in a solution with a radically different pH, the organism is going to have a range of tolerance in which it can tolerate a range of different factors. For example, the concentration of pH in whatever solution it's in. Within a certain range, it will be able to function. But at a certain point, when it gets outside of this pH range, bam, the cell membrane will just denature. And all of the stuff inside the organism will simply join the milieu of the environment outside of it. And the important thing to note here is that this also applies in physics, for example. When something changes states, water has a number of different states. It can be ice, it can be water, or it can be gas. And at a certain moment, when the heat passes a certain threshold, bam, it will instantly change states. And this showcases the sense of equilibrium that is going to allow objects to come about. This is what is going to allow things to have enduring existence. But it is not an absolute existence. It is always a relative existence in a field of intensive difference, which is only going to be defined in its differential relations to what it is not yet, what it has already been, and the other elements of the assemblage that it is within. So I hope this has given you some ideas of how do we relate Dozen Guattari's philosophy to other fields, other ways of thinking, how does this relate to Hegel and other ways of kind of coming up with substance ontologies and things like that, and how are Deleuze and Guattari moving towards more of a process ontology, which is epitomized by their constant emphasis on becoming. Instead of being, they want to focus on becoming. And this becoming is bred into existence with the fact that partial objects come about through intensive differences. I hope this has given you some help. Please leave comments in the comment section if you have any questions, concerns, or any constructive criticisms, and I'll see you in another lecture.